I'm uh, particularly uh, excited to have Dr. Kilgore with us uh, today. This has been actually a long time in coming. I think it was probably more like five or six years ago when I threatened that this might happen. So uh, um, I appreciate the Kennedy Center and uh, Center for the Study of Europe and Scandinavia that uh, made this, uh, this possible. I uh, first became acquainted with Dr. Kilgore quite, quite by accident while uh, he and I were both graduate students. I was uh, uh, in Copenhagen doing research on my dissertation and was recommended by, uh, I believe it was uh, Professor Peel Dalrup uh, at uh, the University of Copenhagen to sit in on his class uh, on Søren Kierkegaard. And I thought this was an excellent idea um, as I was trying to make the leap from Norwegian to Danish. Uh, spoken uh, Danish is uh, fairly difficult, especially coming from Norwegian. And I thought it would this also be a great opportunity to get an introduction to uh, Kierkegaard from a Danish perspective as well. Um, the course uh, has proved uh, uh, remarkably enduring in the way that I think about, about Kierkegaard. Um, and I find myself going back to even to those lecture notes to this day to think about uh, how, to or how uh, Kierkegaard is uh, uh, influenced very much by the historical and cultu cultural circumstances uh, that, um, of his time. Uh, I should also say that during my stay in Copenhagen, Dr. Kilgore was extraordinarily accommodating and helpful, uh, and I'm very glad to count him as a, as a friend. Dr. Kilgore received the equivalent of our Master of Arts degree in English and Danish in 2000 and his PhD in Nordic Literature from the University of Copenhagen. Uh, he has studied and carried out research at Harvard and Berkeley and as well as Humboldt University in Berlin. In 2007, he became an Associate Professor of Danish Literature at the University of Copenhagen and then in 2011 became Director for the Society for Danish Language and Literature in Copenhagen. Uh, central amongst his research topics is the Danish Golden Age, uh, a period lasting from about 1800 to 1850. Hans Christian Andersen and Søren Kierkegaard are, are probably the most familiar and recognizable writers of the period. But Dr. Kilgore's work has insisted that both figures did not write in a vacuum, uh, and that the historical, philosophical, and cultural context of these authors uh, were enormously influ influential in shaping their thinking and writing. Two books have emerged from his thinking on the historical and cultural life of Golden Age Denmark. The first is based on his dissertation entitled The Soul After Death, The Golden Age's Modern Breakthrough, which was published in 2007. An earlier book uh, titled Between Each Other, Tableau and Story in Kierkegaard's, pseudonyms, su Kierkegaard's Pseudonymous Works, published in 2001. Uh, we did discuss the title Between Each Other as a, as an English translation of, of a Danish term uh, that is very difficult to translate. Uh, it has more Kantian overtones than between each other might suggest. So um, if, you're more, if you're interested in that, uh, there'll be a question and answer session after. Uh, he has also worked extensively on 20th century Danish literature, publishing articles in various journals and periodicals, and contributing to the Danish publisher Gildendal's multi-volume, uh, The History of Danish Literature. He has also served as editor of the influential literary journal Critique during the years uh, 2004 to 2012. And he also serves uh, as the literary reviewer for the daily newspaper of Politiken. Since 2011, he has worked as the director for the Society for Danish Language and Literature. Uh, the society itself was founded in 1911 and is responsible for the publication and documentation of the Danish language and Danish literature and a central institution in the preservation and dissemination of Danish culture. As director, he has been instrumental in a critical edition of Karin Blixen's work. And if you're interested in hearing more about his work on Karin Blixen, and particularly the colonial dimensions of her authorship, Dr. Kilgore will be offering another lecture tomorrow at 2 p.m. in the library. Uh, the title of the lecture is Out of British East Africa, Isak Dinesen and the Trials of Colonialism. There are flyers actually over there on the, on the uh, table there if you'd, if you'd like to pick one up. It looks like, it looks like this. Uh, currently, he is working on a book project about the welfare state and its significance and representation in Danish literature between 1950 and 1980, and uh, it's this that forms the basis of his lecture today, so please welcome Dr. Kilgore. Thank you so much for having me here, and thank you, Nate, for this very uh, gracious, uh, very generous introduction. And uh, thank you all for coming to, uh, to hear about this uh, uh, topic, which I assume may be a bit exotic, uh, uh, at least, you know, 
Denmark is a very uh, small country in the remote part of Northern Europe. I'm trying to point it out here. So it's, it's um, I assume that, that there will be lots of questions from you about the, uh, the, some of the context. You know, I'm going to talk about the welfare state. I'm going to talk about the welfare state debate, and I'm going to talk about how uh, fiction and imaginative writing became involved in this debate. And please feel free to ask a question about anything afterwards. I hope that we will have ample of time for that. And uh, if you're not uh, have any questions, I'm going to ask you a lot of things because I. I must confess that one of the few things I knew about uh, Utah before coming here was this wonderful emblem of uh, your state, the beehive, a symbol that can have many uh, positive meanings, like, for instance, uh, corporation or industry, which is spelled out in the inscription to this sculpture, which I believe you know uh, very well. Uh, I would like to begin with this image of the beehive because it also appears in a poem by the Swedish modernist poet uh, Gunnar Egelöf, whom you can see here, a poem called Til de Folkhemska. This is a title which is very uh, difficult to uh, translate both into English and into to Danish as well. It is, the title is a dedication it is directly addressed to somebody, to a group of people who is named by a neologism coined by Egelöf, die Folkhemska. This word is derived from the word Folkhemmet, uh, the people's home, which is one of the earliest political metaphors of the welfare state. In fact, it was a metaphor that came into being and, and uh, was, uh, was uh, in use before the concept of the welfare state itself existed in Swedish. The word Folkhemmet presents the welfare state as a social un unit comparable to the f one formed by a family living together, not only as a place of residence, not only as a house, but also as a home. The word Folkhemmet was coined, it wasn't coined, but it was deployed politically by uh, Pia Albin Hansen, who was uh, a Swedish uh, social Democratic Prime Minister for many years. He, uh, he uh, used it from 1928 and on in order to designate the cozy and inclusive people's home that were to replace class society. It became a household, household word, word both for the social democratic uh, political vision but also for the Swedish welfare state in general. So 17 years later, Gunnar Egelöf picked up this work, Folkhemmet, and then coupled it with the word hemsk, which in Swedish means ghastly or mean. So he made a composite word that works uh, something like, uh, if you know Freud's concept of the un unheimlich, it's a word that points to something that is both familiar and alien at the same time. It metamorphoses all the positive connotations of the people's home into something very sinister. To the terrible welfare statish people, that is a possible yet not very, yet not very uh, poetically gratifying translation of the title of, the, of uh, Egelöf's poem, Til die Folkhemske, to the terrible welfare statish people. This negative wording resonates with the vision of the welfare state evolved or evoked in Egelöf's poem which is very pessimistic indeed. And this is where the beehive comes in. The people's home is depicted by Egelöf as a beehive, as a rational and orderly, extremely utilitarian and efficient society, but also as a conformist and completely sterile society, a place where all citizens act like little bees serving the queen bee, Svea. Expediency is the key concept governing this society where everything must serve a purpose, where everybody is busy serving the state. And that is exactly what Igle refuses to do according to the title of the collection of the poems that include Til die Folkhemske. The title is Non Serviam, a Latin phrase meaning I will not serve. I will not be a servant of the welfare state. Go away, you terrible welfare statish people, 
with your demands for aesthetic utility, I would not argue against you because arguing would only conform, would only confirm your discourse of rationality. Instead, I will present you with an elaborate poetic image of the kind of state you're turning Sweden into, a beehive state, that is. This poetic reply to the welfare state is not to be misunderstood. It's very clear. It's a total rejection. But it isn't a very surprising response either. This is what you would expect from an aristocratic, bohemian, modernist poet, poet like Gunnar Egelöf, that he would turn his back on a political project like the Scandinavian welfare state with its egalitarianism, its social engineering, and its leveling of social differences. This is, of course, a very crude characterization, both of Egelöf and of the welfare state, but the tendency itself this tendency for authors and, art and artists to meet the welfare state either with disavowal or indifference is pervasive. The American literary and social critic Irving Howe remarked over 30 years ago, and I quote, in its own right, the welfare state doesn't seem to be able to arouse strong loyalty. It seems easier to, to die for the stars and the stripes or the prole proletarian fatherland than for unemployment insurance and social security. There are fewer sub-rational loyalties and perhaps no encompassing, encompassing mystique for the welfare state to exploit." Unquote. I think that is true. I think it's true that the welfare state doesn't seem to have produced powerful emotions that have channeled into aesthetic energy as such. And this is one reason, and several others can be listed, can be listed why one would surmise that the relationship between the welfare state and literature would be a merely negative one. Negative in both senses, either as a topic to be avoided, something deemed unworthy of literary attention, or something only usable as an occasional target of satire, ridicule, or frontal attack, as in the case of Egelöf's poem. In Swedish literature, and this is a very bold, bold statement, but I think that in Swedish literature in the 20th century, this has very much been the case. The relationship between the welfare state and literature is merely a negative one. In Danish literature, in the same period, however, things are different, or at least they were different for a period of time. From the middle of the 1950s and into the 1970s, a number of Danish authors and intellectuals engaged with the welfare state, or more precisely, they engaged with issues in the ongoing public discussion of the welfare state. They did so in ways that were not only critical, but also showing signs of solidarity. They wrote essays and gave talks on the welfare state, but they also wrote dramas and film scripts and tales of fictions, and tales of fiction which can be interpreted as contributions to the ongoing cultural reflection of the welfare state. Fiction was, in other words, used as a tool for thinking about the welfare state in these years. This is at least what I'm trying to argue in this book that I'm working on. And, and uh, as uh, Professor Kramer said, it's, it's five or six years since we talked uh, for the first time about, about this talk. And I'm afraid that I'm still working on this book. So it has been a long time coming as well. In the book, I'm trying to describe and analyze the, the dialogue unfolding between literary and political discourses on the welfare state in these crucial decades when the welfare state came into being and became an object of public debate. And why is that? Why would authors and intellectuals suddenly engage themselves in this dialogue about the welfare state, you may ask? I see at least two reasons why imaginative writing became involved in the debate. One is the paradoxical situation of the debate itself, which was due to the semantic instability and the ambivalence of the term welfare state itself. In fact, this term was imported from the American political debate, where it was used mainly at the time in the pejorative sense as a term of abuse. President Truman had in fact banned the word from the Democratic campaign in 1950 due to that reason that it was a scare word, as he called it. And you can also follow that when it came into, when it was important, imported into the Danish debate, it was also used in the pejorative sense mainly 
as a scare word. And for that reason, proponents of welfare state policies avoided it and didn't want to talk about the welfare state. But also, opponents of the welfare state were suspicious of the term as they believed it to be rhetorically seductive. Who could really have anything against welfare? How could you possibly argue against the pursuit of welfare, they asked. And for that re this reason, they wanted to, to uh, reframe the debate by talking about the paternal state or formula state, as they called it, instead of the welfare state. For this reason, nobody was really keen on using the word. Nobody was keen on talking about the development of the welfare state as such, at least not with the use of these words. So this created a strange situation where it was difficult to discuss what was happening at the same time that there was a strong feeling, both among politicians and among general public, that something was really happening, that a new uh, formation of society was shaping up. I believe this paradoxical situation created a certain space for imaginative writing to fill in, to supplement political debate. Another factor that facilitated the exchange between political and literary circles at the time was the great attentiveness that politicians extended towards writers and artists and intellectuals. Let me demonstrate that by quoting to you an interview with uh, Viggo Kampmann, who served as governing prime minister at this time in 1960. He's the gentleman with the cigar. Uh, one, one wouldn't be able to guess from this picture, but he is actually at this, this moment in time, he is the prime minister, and uh, one standing uh, to the right of him, Julius Bromholt, was the first Danish minister of uh, culture. And they're both into deep water, as you can see. <laughs> in uh, 1960, when uh, Viggo Kampmann was uh, prime minister, he gave an interview to the Danish daily newspaper, Information, with a heading that must be considered rather extraordinary given that it's a quote from a prime minister in power. The banner headline said, actually, I'm not so interested in politics. This is uh, an, an, a very remarkable utterance from a politician in power. So the interviewer asked him what he was interested in himself and Kampen declared himself to be more interested in culture and art in general than politics in a narrow sense. He confessed to the interviewer his inclination to modernist fiction, both international and Danish, as well as to the great deli delight he derived from following cultural pages in foreign papers and magazines. In terms of Danish literature, Kampen had been absorbed with Willy Sørensen, a Danish author whom I'll return to in a minute, and this made the interviewer ask him if he agreed with Willy Sørensen that the tacit condition of the whole welfare system is that it's a means, not a goal. And Kampmann replied, one cannot, one cannot politically provide a people with happiness. Willy Sørensen is right about that. And then he went on to explain how far his agreement with Willy Sørensen actually reached. And I have a longer quote from him here, saying, one of my main problems is how to remove the present division between culture and politics. We politicians are very much in need of guidance. Much would be gained if only the culturally interested would leave their critical stand and begin to counsel us in a fund and understanding manner. They may, of course, withdraw themselves, but must be aware that governed there will be. Then why not participate yourself with some refreshing views?" Unquote. So here's a prime minister holding out his hands to a group called the culturally interested asking for their help in shaping the welfare state, solving some of the issues it entails. If that is indeed what he does, for regarded as a speech act, it is a strange combination of a request and a threat that Kampmann issues here. Please help us, but if you don't, somebody must steer the ship and we will do as we see fit. Nevertheless, the invitation was accepted and there was, in the following years, there was a rapprochement, one, would, one could say, between political and intellectual and literary circles that had institutional ramifications on a, national, on a massive uh, national scale. For instance, the Ministry of Culture was, uh, was uh, established the year after. Uh, 
There was a, a, a reformation of the state's fund for the endowment of the arts, which became a very general sponsor of modernist art in particular. And there were many new public libraries and new local art museums and concerts hall opened in the following years, rendering both literary, musical, and visual, visual art accessible to new audiences. All of this happened in the name of the welfare state and partook in a general Scandinavian trend. There's a sociologist, uh, Peter Doolan, who has concluded that after the Second World War, the objectives underlying state cultural policy in all the Nordic countries were formulated as part of the general welfare program. And this is indeed, or this was indeed, also very much the case in Denmark, and it is, or it was, an important feature of the Scandinavian welfare state, this cultural component, you know, that it wasn't only about uh, raising the, the, uh, the uh, uh, social standards, the, the, uh, or expanding the safety, safety net, it was also about uh, offering uh, people uh, cultural uh, possibilities in their spare time. Interestingly, the Prime Minister refers in the interview to an author for a deeper understa conceptual understanding of the welfare state. And the author that he is referring to is the eminent Danish modernist uh, uh, poet, Vili Sørensen, whom uh, Professor Kramer also has done uh, some very outstanding work upon. Vili Sørensen participated in the welfare state debate from very early, both with essays and tales of fiction. In 1956, he gave a talk in a Danish radio called The Welfare State and the Suspended uh, Personality. And you can see politicians from the time, you know, returning to this uh, talk, which was later turned into an essay. They returned to it again and again. The essay is an attempt at a conceptual clarification of the discussion of the welfare state. Willy Sørensen was convinced as a sort of idealist that there was a certain idea of the welfare state that was independent of any empirical embodiment. And the big task that he took upon himself was to expand this idea. He said, and I quote, the idea of the welfare state is not that one, when eventually reaching a certain age, which is the only requirement, should have rights to education and housing, work and unemployment benefit and old age pension, because all that follows from the idea, but that everybody should feel safe as members of society which doesn't mean that they should feel safe as human beings, because they shouldn't. The implied condition of the whole welfare system is that it's only a means, not an end. Social security can never be an end in itself, only a background for the personal existence of the individual." Unquote. This is a rather convoluted statement that needs some unpacking. His idea of the welfare state is that it was to provide a sense of security on a social level. But this, again, should be considered an instrument to achieve a further purpose, to take on a higher wager, that of winning a personality. That was not something the welfare state should help you with. The welfare state created a social space where one would be free to develop one's individual personality, but also free not to do so. The welfare state shouldn't be blamed for the choice that people made, but should rather be commended for furnishing so many with this choice. That was how his argument went. So the goal of the welfare state wasn't to put the population in a, a state of bliss or happiness. On the contrary, the welfare state was seen by Sørensen as a means to afford the opportunity for many more people to face the perils of existence, to give people also the opportunity to be aware of their unhappiness, one could say, and to work with it constructively. Poets and Demons, the collection of essays containing this uh, piece by Sørensen on the welfare state became a Bible for a whole generation of Danish intellectuals, writers and teachers of literature coming of age in the late 50s. But it also had a considerable impact on influential politicians who appropriated and popularized Sørensen's thought. His definition of the welfare state as an open system with an objective external to itself became a kind of common ground upon which politicians and authors could engage. It provided the platform for the dialogue, so to speak. But Sørensen did not only uh, address the, 
welfare state with uh, discursive contributions like this, this he also wrote fiction that addressed topics of the welfare state. In his uh, authorship, it can be detected as a general theme that many of his tales from the 1950s and 60s explored and which he characterized, categorized himself as the tutelage problem, the formula problematique. The earliest of Willy Sørensen's tales addressing this tutelage theme is Kuman the Grocer from his 1955 collection of stories called Harmless Stories or Ufali Historia. And this is, I'm just gonna give you this one example of how uh, you know, fiction addressed uh, the question of the welfare state. There are many more, and I'll be happy to provide you with more examples afterwards, but I only have uh, time for this one example in the talk. The, uh, the story, The Grocer, is about a grocer who insists on selling his customers only what they really need, not necessarily what they want to buy. If you come into his store and ask for something, you know, a pack of cigarettes, then the grocer says, no, I will not sell you that because I can see your, what you're really feeling is a deep longing for your girlfriend who's away from you. Let me uh, sell you instead a postcard so you can write a postcard for your girlfriend. This is what you, what you really need. So in this way, uh, the, the grocer, he acts as a, as a paternalistic uh, figure who uh, exercises what one may call a kind of micro-politics against the market. His enterprise rests on the assumption that he is the one who knows what his customers really need. A grocer must take care to keep his customers in good health, for then he keeps his customers, he explains at a certain point to his son. That's the premise of his e enterprise, which is both eth ethical and pragmatic. It is born out of care for his customers as well as a desire to keep business going. But his argument doesn't succeed in convincing the customers, not the disobedient ones at least. The real legitimacy of the grocer's power derives from his monopolistic position on the local market for convenience, convenience, gross, for, for convenience goods. He is the only uh, grocer in the area, and as soon as, uh, as uh, this monopoly is broken, his power collapses. The tale is allegorical and contains several layers of meaning. One is, of course, very, uh, very uh, manifestly, the ongoing historical transformation uh, of the retail business at the time as self-service uh, shops were introduced in large numbers in Denmark at the time, inspired by what had already happened in the US. Self-service shops were introduced, replacing counter stores. Yet another tale, lay of the tale deals with the welfare state and the paternalism that is, uh, that is uh, entailed by the welfare state. It deals, one could say, with the emancipation of the individual from the market, which the welfare state, which was still very much in the making in the year of 1955 when the tale was published, was meant to facilitate. This is also evident from the climactic and rather comical reply uttered by the grocer when commercial competition destroys his regime. Det er verdens undergang. Menneskene vil ekspedere, vil ekspedere sig selv. It's the end of the world. People want to serve themselves, he says again to his son. This uh, reply uh, uh, commands some attention. Serve is expedere in the original Danish, and it comes from Latin expedere, meaning liberate. So the sentence actually has uh, three meaning. Man wants to serve himself as in a self-service shop. Man wants to emancipate himself. And three, man wants to kill himself, for the word expedia can also mean eliminate in Danish. In this way, the key word of the tale couples emancipation and self-destruction together as closely related possibilities. And you can, you can follow this dialectical line of thinking in Sørensen's later essays dealing with the welfare state. This is just one example of what fiction could do in the welfare state debate. It could dig deeper into issues and dilemmas and into the social complexities that lay underneath the surface of the political discussion. In the book that I'm writing, I try to analyze a number of Danish literary texts, but also dramas and films from the 50s, 60s, and 70s that 
can be interpreted in this light with the welfare state as a frame of reference. I use them, one could say, as tools for thinking about the welfare state and try to unfold their contribution to this cultural reflection of the welfare state going on. Several researchers, especially within philosophy and the social sciences, have pointed to the philosophical deficit which the welfare state can be said to suffer from as a state form. This is something you hear again and again, that there is neither a foundational philosophy of the welfare state nor any elaborate ideology that has been pinned down as a political uh, manifesto of some sort. Also, it has been noted, and especially with reference to the Danish case, case that there was no master plan behind the welfare state. There was no blueprint for the welfare state in Denmark or in the other Scandinavian countries. And this is also a reason, I think, for uh, fiction. You know, this was an ongoing uh, uh, negotiation that took place, and this also made a certain room for, for fiction to come in and participate in the negotiations. This is, uh, I think I will stop here because then we will have time to, uh, for, for questions, questions of all sorts uh, about uh, uh, texts or context or clarification or please feel free to ask. Thank you. We have a, a few minutes for question and answers. Uh, the, uh, the Kennedy Center has asked, if, since this is being recorded, if you would make your way to the microphone over here and ask your questions from the microphone. That way they can, uh, I guess, record these. So please, uh, come up to the microphone. As, as you're making your way up here, I do have a, a, a question. Um, I wonder, so with Willy Sorensen um, and Maya, they were involved in a kind of very public debate uh, about this. I wonder if you would say just a little bit about, I think this, this is very fascinating, this intersection between politics and, and literature. If you might comment a little bit about, you know, how the Danish public perceived that, uh, what the context was. I would be happy to. Uh, he, Willy uh, he, Sørensen, uh, he, uh, he engaged himself in the welfare state debate from the earliest, you know, the first welfare state debate in Denmark was in 1956 concerning the introduction of, uh, of old age pension, and he engaged himself in that um, uh, discussion, and he contributed to the debate uh, for many years, but, but you know, as a, kind of, uh, as a kind of intellectual. He wasn't widely read, but he was read by very influential people who, who felt very inspired by what he wrote. But in the uh, 70s, in 1978, he, uh, he went very uh, directly into Danish politics when he wrote a book. It was a collaborative work with two uh, co-authors uh, called uh, uh, Oprør fra Midten, a Revolt from the Middle, something like that. Revolt from the Center, which was, it was a bestseller. It, it sold uh, a huge uh, number of copies in, in Denmark and it became a focus for political discussion for a period of time. There were uh, lots of things happening in the wake of this book. And it was actually, at that, at that time, the welfare state was, uh, was in a crisis. It was in an economic crisis due to uh, the, uh, the general economic crisis of the 70s, but also, uh, but also uh, related to uh, problems of how to to, uh, to, uh, to manage the welfare state and especially manage the expansion of the welfare state in the 70s. And it was also in a political crisis uh, due to some uh, new political movements, political parties that had involved in the 70s. So at this point in time, uh, Willy Sørensen uh, decided to go very directly into the debate with a, a kind of manifesto, really, uh, for how to, on how to uh, reform the welfare state. And it's, you know, when you read it today, they, it's, really, um, it's really interesting because the, the ideas seem very radical. You know, they, they had a, um, a notion that, you know, uh, they wanted to introduce uh, uh, equal pay for all kinds of work the reward of work shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be measured in economic terms, 
but should be, uh, you know, measured in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, um, in the uh, service to the community and in the devotion to the job, for, for instance. And uh, they also had some other pretty, you know, they were, when you read it today, it's, it's really a pre-communitarian manifesto. It, it's right at the time that communitarianism was, was formulated as political philosophy in the U.S. and, and they were, they were um, turning into similar ideas. And as I said, at that, that moment, he became a very important political figure. Thanks for being here. Um, my question, I wanted uh, to hear a little bit more about, um, I mean, you, you pointed early on that there's this kind of ambivalence um, between literature and, and the welfare state. And <clears throat> I think about the work of someone like Ivar Lo Johansson in, in Sweden, yeah. right, who's constantly struggling with, with this very fact, right? He's a yeah. proletarian author. Yeah. He identifies himself with the, the proletariat, yes. and yet he's a writer. Right, and is there an inherent kind, and, and, and that separates him from his yeah. class, from yeah. his from his people, as, yes. as he sees it, and he's constantly struggling with this, yes. you know, in his writing. I mean, is there an inherent um, kind of disconnect between the collective project um, and the idea of self-expression, which literature tends mm -hmm. not um, it tends to privilege, although not exclusively, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, is that where a lot of the ambivalence? perhaps comes from, is that I think it's a, it's a very important source and a very, uh, very interesting uh, uh, problem. And it also comes up in, in uh, Willy Sørensen's authorship because his background was, was very similar. He also came from a, from a proletarian uh, background and he wrote, he wrote very directly about what he called the social traumas, you know, the social traumas uh, connected with mm -hmm. upward social mobility that you feel some kind of, uh, uh, treason you know against uh, your own class and that was kind of the that was kind that was one uh, uh, facet of the new psychological existential problems that would come along with the welfare state where he saw uh, arts and and literature and you know existential psychology as resources for uh, for managing these problems mm -hmm. That was part of his. Uh, it's it's not. It's just a way of, of trying to draw a parallel to the Danish case, which I which I know better. Mm -hmm. But that was, it it was used by him as an argument for uh, the welfare state to go so uh, deeply into to uh, sponsoring art. Mm -hmm. We need art in order to to deal with the trauma that we've just caused exactly. ourselves. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Was... Thank you. All right. Thank you again. Uh, so I guess most people here are American, and like the, the notion of welfare state is kind of scary, uh, especially when you have to deal with immigration. Yes. And like, what kind of, uh, I guess, defense mechanism would 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 uh, Denmark have that maybe other countries don't? Because for me, I'm I'm from France, yes. and uh, welfare and that form yes. of things completely yes. destroyed our economy yeah. with immigration and everything. And I don't know the case of Denmark. I don't know what kind of if it's if it's really working and everything, and if so, how are you able to manage immigration? It is a, it is a very big question in the contemporary uh, politics in Denmark and has been for uh, for two decades now. And there are, you know, it's 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 uh, interesting to see how these uh, uh, threats against the welfare states how they evolve over time. You know, I I mentioned the crisis in the 70s before, which was. Uh, uh, primarily an economic crisis. When when people talk about threats against the welfare state today, it is it is how to deal with. It is very much demographical uh, issues. It is how to deal with immigration. It is also how to deal, and that is a general European problem, how to to deal with uh, an aging population, with a with a, a pyramid of uh, uh, of the population where you get more and more. Um, uh, people in uh, in old age who require um, service from the welfare state, and fewer and fewer in the workforce that are there to to uh, to finance it. So it's it's I don't know if we've we've found any. Um, uh, it's it's an ongoing discussion, and I I don't think we've uh, reached um, a certain. Uh, um, 
solution to uh, to the issues as well. But I must say that it's, it's become very uh, politicized in Denmark. This question of uh, immigration—it's something that you can that you can uh, you can win elections upon about being uh, uh, restrictive on uh, immigration. So so Danish immigration laws have been become increasingly uh, inc uh, restrictive within the last uh, decades. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you see any bearing between the long tradition of uh, the folk high school on the one hand, both in Denmark and Sweden, and folk hemet uh, in particularly uh, Denmark? That's a very interesting uh, question. I think in the folk high school uh, was, was part of this uh, uh, cooperative culture growing in the, uh, in the 19th century, uh, which was also, you know, uh, in the, uh, there were co-ops uh, established by, uh, by farmers. And I think that's, that's one important uh, cultural source for the formation of, uh, of the, the welfare state. Also this, uh, uh, the Folkhoi School, also the, the high uh, cultural ideals of this, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, movement that it was, you know, um, about education and enlightenment. I think that's also part of the um, foundation for the cultural policies of the welfare state. But there are many other, it, it's a, it's a, there are so many roots, you know, it's, it's a whole um, area of research within itself, you know, how tracing the roots of the welfare state. There are also, uh, you know, some pointing to the, to the, uh, to the Lutheran tradition of the, of the Swedish and uh, Danish societies as, a, as an important source. Uh, of course, the, uh, the high um, uh, degree of organization of workers in the um, workers' movements is, is yet another source. So there are different sources coming together. Thank you. About four or five years ago, um, 60 Minutes uh, news report organization reported that Danes were the happiest people in the world. And uh, they intimated that perhaps the reason for that was because of a, uh, the nature of a social welfare state mm -hmm. that is a prevalent in Denmark. And uh, when asked people, they responded, we are happy because we are content with, with uh, uh, the, all the things that we have mm -hmm. uh, under the social welfare system. Now, is this, uh, do you believe this is an accurate understanding or that the Danes are happy because of uh, the nature of a social solidarity and the availability of all the goods and services for the all Den Denmark? And also, uh, if that's the case, if they are content, mm -hmm. the reason why they're happy is because they are content, mm -hmm. does that mean Danes lack motivation ambition, uh, taking risk mm -hmm. for the future? You're, you're pointing to a, a very uh, central uh, problem in the welfare state uh, discussion from the 1950s and on. That was exactly the, the critique of the welfare state at that point, you know, that it would uh, deprive uh, people of this, uh, um, this willingness to take risks and this uh, also the, the uh, the formative uh, aspects of taking risks that it also has a has a positive um, influence on how to uh, to uh, develop as a as a person. I I'm not so much uh, I I've never really uh, gone very deeply into these uh, these uh, surveys of uh, happiness. I think I can only refer that, you know one of the explanations that are usually given is the one that you quote that that. You know, psychologists point to uh, a feeling of safety being an important uh, uh, condition for feeling happy. You know that that uh, that that uh, happiness is is um, um, uh, is often uh, or, or can be encouraged or can be um, promoted by feeling safe. That is perhaps an, expl an explanation. I'm not sure, but it is. It is still a discussion of if this, uh, if this uh, self-complacency, one could also uh, call it, is a, 
an inhibiting factor in the development of society that there are there is not uh, enough uh, innovation and uh, productivity and, and stuff like that. These are big issues in, in current politics. I don't have an answer. So what is the current thinking? So, uh, is the Danes willing to have that trade-off, be content and uh, satisfied with life, but not necessarily driven like, let's say, in the US or other Western uh, industrial society? I are you willing to? I, th I think so, or at least, you know, uh, all surveys, you know, they consistently show a very uh, large uh, commitment to the welfare state. And also, if you, want to, if you want to seek power in politics, in Danish politics, you can only declare yourself as a friend of the welfare state. Nobody is against the welfare state. That would be, uh, that would be political suicide, or you, you, you cannot uh, pursue power in that, uh, in that manner. So at least the, the name or the brand of the welfare state is, is, uh, is very powerful still. If, if, I think people are, are willing to, to, to compromise and also compromise for, for standards of living in terms of uh, you know, for trading for this uh, very generous uh, welfare state system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your attendance. Can we give Dr. Kilgore a hand of applause again? Thank you.